delicious roast emperor penguin bones. So the food was important and maybe kept them somewhat healthy, the fresh meat. 18th of October, 1915, gradually healing over to the port side. Uh, yeah. That's been the wrong place, but anyway, where did the, the map which I'm showing you parts of? So we've now reached here. So there's a long way to land. Their home is being crushed. This is all ice. And the nearest place where they might get food was going to be Paulette Island up here, where a Swedish expedition had been 10 years earlier and hopefully left some food. Maybe they could get over to some to Deception Island, where we were yesterday, where there was uh, whaling activities in the factories, so they could eat well meat or something. This is their first camp then. The endurance was abandoned on the 27th of October. All including surrounders continued turns with the pumps, which were able to keep pace. Shackleton was the last to leave and they established a dump camp. So at this stage, they were 350 miles from Paulette Island, and they had food for 56 days. Over the next month, they removed whatever needed be uh, to, uh, to, um, to uh, help them set up a temporary camp. Uh, I think they had a magnetic hut with them, which they dismantled and burnt uh, to keep themselves warm. And this is a, a, an iconic photograph of the dogs uh, as the endurance began to disappear. <coughs> So um, they then went to transfer to a, another camp on the 1st of November, Ocean Camp, which was a nice, just a nice hill, half a mile across. And they stayed there till nearly the end of December. Then Shackleton decided, well, we've got to try and get some motivation going. So he decided they'd start dragging the boats. And here is Shackleton in Ushuaia. Shackleton not pulling very hard here. Mm -hmm. Across the ice. It's actually quite an interesting exhibition if you have time in the um, uh, Galleria Thematica down the end of San Marto on Shackleton and the endurance trip. It's, uh, I recommend it. It's not free, but anyway. Um, here's paintings by Marston, who had been in Shackleton with them on the ice boat. Um, they had concerts and with the Hussey banjo. It's gratifying to hear the ring of hearty laughter that betokens contentment and humor. The attributes of excellent leadership and good eating. Uh, Hurley, a great admiration for the boss, who's very considerate and kindly disposed, and an excellent comrade. So the 27th of November, they had three boats with them, and they were given names, James Caird, after one of the main sponsors, Dudley Docker and Stamford Will. So what they were hoping to happen would be that they drift northwards and eventually the pack ice would break up, they get into the boats, and maybe get some to safety. By the 12th of December, they were 250 miles from Paulette, but they were too far east. So uh, Paulette Island is somewhere here, and uh, they were far too far east. They kept drifting northwards, and they launched the boats in April, at which stage Paulette had been passed, and Elephant Island was the main objective at that stage. Uh, 14th of January, they shot the dog teams, having previously, when they started on the ice, they shot the cat and the puppies. The cat on an ice boat was not fair on the cat. Um, on the 9th of April, they launched the boats, and they had probably the worst week of the whole trip, in which many of them, over the next week, in the open boats, suffered from frostbite, seasickness, thirst was a terrible thing. They were absolutely parched. They found some chopped up seal meat, frozen sea meat, they ate that, which was a little bit of a help so they could suck the water out of it. Um, some of them uh, became very, very um, um, mentally um, um, down. And would you get excited when you saw this, which was their landfall? This is the first time I saw it in 1990, oh, 1999, 1998, I think, um, at 
5 a.m. in the morning. It was first up, and it didn't look very exciting to me. Anyway, they landed at Cape Valentine and Elephant Island on the 15th of April, by which time two of the men had very badly frozen feet, Green Street, Green Street and the stowaway Blackburn, young fellow. And how they managed to get there is uh, just amazing, but one of the key people all the time was the navigator, Frank Worsley. Without his maps and his sightings, they wouldn't have made it. Um, first bus carried ashore at that landing, where they landed for the first time on on land, if you call it land, yes, 497 days since they were last on land. Uh, when they landed, both Wilde and Shackleton hadn't slept for 100 hours, trying to navigate and make sure the three boats with all the men reached land. Here they are, <coughs> Cape Manor time, but it was very exposed shore. So the next day, Frank Wilde went all seven miles down the north coast of um, Elephant Island. This is actually them just landing. In fact, uh, yeah, one of them here, when they did land, he went and found this place. So the last one drops Cape Valentine. This is a, a point wild, or just about point bloody wild. And actually, when they landed there eventually the following day, on the 17th of April, uh, one of the men had a heart attack, Rickinson. Uh, and uh, some other people, Hudson, for example, was in very, very bad shape. That's what it looked like then, and that's what it looks like now. Not an ideal camping site. Uh, Shackleton of Wordy wrote of Shackleton at that time, the boss is wonderfully cheering everyone and far more active than any other person in camp. Frank Hurley wrote, oh, this place reminds me of some lines from Robert Service, a land of savage grandeur that measures each man all his worth. And he then went on to criticize quite a few members of the crew weren't measuring up to being proper men. This is the island, just, just <laughs> Elton Island, about 23 miles long, and this is the first landing, second landing. Shackleton didn't delay long. He invited people to come with him on the trip, which would hopefully bring rescue, which was to South Georgia, 800 miles away, who volunteered, everyone volunteered, but he then chose quite carefully who was going to come with him. First of all, Frank Worsley, who was a navigator, who would take the sightings, make sure they didn't miss South Georgia. Um, and then he took a number of other characters, including <laughs> McNeish, who was the shipwright, and he'd actually got ready the uh, James Caird here by raising the gunnels. He'd done that previously, and he covered it over with um, um, sledging runners and boxes and canvas. So he was a valuable member of the party. He brought an Irish fellow from County Cork, um, Tim McCarthy, he brought Tom Cree. He brought a guy called Vincent, who had already been derated on the trip for being um, uh, belligerent and uh, disobeying. Uh, and I can't remember who else. Anyway, there were six of them. Half of them were from Ireland. That's the important part to remember. <laughs> Shackleton, when he left, said, it's hateful having to tell men that we've got to leave them. If things went wrong, it might be said I had abandoned them. The tale of the next 16 days is one of supreme strife and leaving water. And here they are saying goodbye to the James Caird. The next day, that bay filled with ice, so they wouldn't have got away. And here is the photograph of waving. I call this the Hurley Wave. Um, once when I was down there, we were actually were in South Georgia, but it was at the other end of the trip in, where they ended up. Uh, we did a sort of Hurley Wave. And it's quite interesting because everyone's waving, but one person hasn't got those arms up in the air. And they, We've got a hand in a, on, on the expedition leader's bottom. <laughs> so we, we discuss that later. <laughs> so the 800 mile journey across the seas, um, 30 days of supplies, water, one of the containers of which broke, and, and off they went. So it was a huge challenge of hunger, pain, exhaustion. Um, even the most optimistic of desperate castaways um, it, it must have thought that James Fair looked very flimsy. Um, the first night out, Shackleton went up to Worsley, or oh, he didn't go up to me, he just sent up and said, look, he said, you know, I know nothing about boat sailing. So Worsley is a key man then sailing the James Caird. Um, Worsley got some key sightings with the sextant for them, which was absolutely crucial. 
if he'd made mistakes, they would have missed South Georgia, they would have ended up way out in the ocean heading towards Africa, and they would all have died a horrible death, and of course all the men on Elephant Island would have been in a right trouble. <coughs> the cook was Tom Crean. This is the primus he used, which is actually in the Canterbury Museum, which I've made in storage. I, I, I don't think it was damaged in the earthquakes. Um, Tom Crean, um, he guarded the pot, and the cooker, and uh, with his frostbitten fingers, he picked it up, dropped it, picked it up again, and toyed with it gingerly as though it was some fragile article of ladies' wear. Anyway, he had great physical and mental strength. Crean, he didn't say too much, he never wrote journals or anything, but he was always cheerful, willing, and dependable. Meanwhile, they got wetter and wetter and colder and colder. That's then the key man, Frank Worsley from Macaro, ended up leaving the UK. And here is the uh, Vincent, who was not awarded a Polar Medal, somewhat controversially, maybe some people think, but he did defy Shackleton, and he was a grumpy fellow who actually, on this James Kerr boat, and it collapsed by the end of it. Another fellow who was very, very cheerful on the trip and was the first to see Antarctic cormorants, and that was a sign of land and kelp, was, sorry, but I should have lightened this a bit. This is Tim McCarthy from Country Court. And he was another person who sadly, after the trip, went into a war effort and was uh, sunk uh, in, um, off the coast of Ireland, I think it was. So they did reach the Georgia the night before. They had a massive hurricane, uh, and they could well have been blown to bits. The boat would have been smashed to bits on the northern face of the island. Shackleton, we could gauge our approach to the unseen cliffs by the roar of the breakers against the sheer walls of rock. The chance of survival that night with a driving gale, implacable sea, forcing us onto the shore, seemed small. I think most of us had the feeling that the end was very near. So they reached South Georgia the 10th of May. It's a very beautiful island I recommend a visit to if you're only really thinking of coming back to Antarctica having left there 526 days previously. Into this bay, King Hawken Bay, they named an island here, McCarthy Island, which is still there. Something to be said for long-standing rock. And this is the cove they went into, and I've very luckily been there once. And the first thing they did was kill some albatross chicks. And McNeish said, Three young and one old albatross for lunch and one pint of gravy. Beats all the chicken soup I've ever tasted. And there is a plaque there. And that's me a while ago. And the plaque is actually put up by an Irish team who tried to redo the boat journey. That was only last redone. No one copied it, was able to recreate it until uh, earlier last year. So the Irish uh, guys failed, but they still put up a plaque on the, on the, on the island, which actually not against the Antarctic Treaty, but Ireland is not a member of the Antarctic Treaty. <coughs> so what they did then, without delay, leaving at 3 a.m. on the 19th of May, uh, Crean, Shackleton, and Worsley crossed South Georgia. It took about 36 hours, about 21 miles, and you all know the story. They didn't bring a tent, uh, because Shackleton knew if they stopped for any length of time, that would be the end of them crossing glaciers, never crossed before. Um, McNeish got screws out of James Caird and put them in the boots. And whilst recent expeditions have up-to-date footwear and clothing, you do remember that they've been on the go for over a year and a half now, probably on clothing which had never been cleaned. Uh, here we are near the end of the journey. Uh, Fortuna Bay, they came down here, they threw away their primus and crossed the, this um, bottomless glacier and up over the last uh, mountains, past this lake, Crean Lake, which Crean walked across and fell into when he was doing the crossing. Um, uh, it was covered in ice, got a soaking. A few years ago, I did the same in the same lake, but it was a lot warmer. Um, this is swimming to the memory of Tom Crean in the lake, uh, which is just near the end of that uh, journey, incredible journey. 7 a.m., 20th of May, Shackleton heard the, at 7 a.m., the whaling station whistle, and the whistle. There, but the music sounds so sweet to our ears, that whistle. They shook hands and 
they were about in civilization. They were walking along a great style, and Cream suddenly fell into the, the, the lake. Yeah. And then the next thing Cream was worrying about, or was it Worsley? I couldn't have Cream, I think, about how his, his trousers, his torn trousers and things would look. So they had to root around to get some safety pins so that um, they'd look a bit decent. Okay. A couple of years ago, I did that last part of the crossing with a fellow called Tim Jarvis. Here he is actually wearing a Mawson helmet because he recreated Mawson's journey previously. And in January, February 1913, 2013, rather, he did that boat crossing and crossed South Georgia, and some of you may have seen it recently in American television. Uh, it took 12 days, and um, it was a very, very grim time for them. They got trench foot, and uh, when they arrived in South Georgia, one of them said that the conditions there were like Scotland on steroids. Um, so, and they also, we, we quoted some famous man saying, the obstacle is the path. It wasn't a nature walk for them either. Uh, they eventually came down to Crickabicken, um, uh, Shackleton, Crean, Worsley, and here is uh, uh, last year, um, in November, on a trip to South Georgia, myself and Falcon got at the bottom of the waterfall, which the others had slid down in May of 1916. So into the wedding manager's house, who hardly believed them. Apparently the wedding manager started shedding tears, but I don't think that's very credible for a top wedding manager. And of course, there's this lovely uh, um, anticlinal folding Z formation behind, which they were able to recognize this was the right place to end up, Stromness wedding station, of course, where there was help. Stromness, a few years later. And this is Shackleton, Queen, and Worsley, having had a shave. Unfortunately, no photograph of them when they had just arrived in uh, South Georgia, the wedding station. So followed on from that, four attempts to rescue the men on Elephant Island. And it was a huge stress on Shackleton. The first was an attempt on the southern sky from South Georgia. They got within 75 miles of Elephant Island. The second was on the Uruguay Instituto de Pesca, 20 miles close, then blocked by the ice. The third was the Emma, from Punta Arenas, got within 100 miles, and it wasn't until the fourth attempt that they managed to rescue the men who were living in these upturned boats for four and a half months into the winter. So there was sort of wall, a four foot stone wall around, and then you had a sort of, there was an upper story and a lower story, and of course this is where various rather grim things like went on, like Blackborough having his toes amputated um, off his left foot, and uh, they got less and less food. They started getting limpets off the kelp. Uh, those are the different attempts at rescue, four attempts. And on the 30th of August, 1916, Shackleton Worsley and a Chilean tug called the Yelcho managed to get in. Here they are. Yelcho is in the distance. And this is Hurley pho photograph. And you see them not, not jumping for joy exactly. And, these two seem to be reading the paper or something. They set up a little sort of smoke signal here. Someone put a kerosene on their some pair of trousers and did that. In the next photograph, the Yelcha got quite close. The smoke has gone out, but these two people still seem to be not, haven't moved very much. Uh, Hurley at it again. Punching the photograph. Yeah. And go there now, and it's a very difficult place to land, but it can be seen from the ship, is, um, is uh, the remaining chinstrap penguins, which no doubt their ancestors supplied uh, Wild, Frank Wild, who looked after the 22 men, well, the 21 men with him for four and a half months and kept their hopes up, is Captain Pardo, a bust of Captain Pardo. I feel it really also should be a bust of Frank Wild. One of the excitements which uh, Conrad referred to last night was when we, we both flew down the Beagle Channel a couple of years ago to Port of Williams and saw the remains of the Elcho, uh, which is rather fun for an Antarctician. Uh, <coughs> back at home, everybody was very excited. Um, um, he was always writing home. Um, wrote to his son, I know you're a great help and comfort to mummy by working well at school and looking after her when she's at home. She's a mother in a million. So he kept close contact and was always sending letters back. Um, here she is. Emily, long-suffering wife. 
just about smiling Cecily and Vicky. <coughs> There's a terrier barking with joy. Uh, one of the things that, in fact, I think some of the Norwegians suggested was they should go, the, the boat was abandoned on the north side of South Georgia, so they actually collected that and brought it back to the UK. And that was, um, and, and also, of course, collected the three remaining men when that happened. But, oh, time machine, 53 days, that's terrible. Um, anyway, this is the boat for James Caird, which you can now go and see in Dulwich College in South London which is where Shackleton eventually left, went to school, having left Ireland. And guarding it is an emperor penguin, I believe. The other part of the journey, which I want, I've got I think about five or so minutes left, 